News Talk. Off the ball. This is News Talk. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball here on News Talk for your Sunday afternoon. John Duggan with you until 7 sitting in for Joe Malloy. So we're joined over the next hour by the Dundalk manager Vinnie Purse and the Irish Times soccer correspondent Gavin Comiskey uh, to reflect upon the Republic of Ireland's one-all draw against Azerbaijan last night and build up to the Serbia game. Listeners, we want to get involved. 53106 on the text number for a cost of 30 cent. Here's a couple. Carbag played top Euro football yearly. Our senior pros are mid-table Premiership Championship. Youth needs time. Very few alternative players available, especially in attack. Build for the Euros. Hewton flopping at Forest and Big Sam could want double a salary for no future outlook. And folks, Ireland need a top-class holding midfielder and another top-class creative midfielder to link midfield to the forwards. And a forward... We two or three in Rice and Grealish, but we know what happened there. We don't have anywhere near a top-class striker. Get rid of Stephen Kenny and hire Jesus. We need miracles, says Noel. Finney and Gavin, how are we doing? Very good. good afternoon. How are you? How's it going? Good, lads. You were there last night, the pair of you. What was the mood music on the ground? A lot of negativity, but you're going to get the extremities of social media and Twitter and text. And, and we do have some different viewpoints today and some really insightful viewpoints from the audience. But how was it in the ground, Vinny? Uh, interesting because um, obviously being so close to Stephen, I watched that part of it very closely before the game. Um, when his name was announced as such, it was a very good reaction to him, uh, particularly the crowd at the back of the goal. They were they were outstanding throughout the, the game. So there was a very good reaction to him, to the team. Um, I felt there was a bit of a feel-good factor going into the game. Um, and I, I was very conscious just to see how that all played out. Um, so I, I felt the, the mood on the night was, was good by and large. And, and to be fair, a lot of the fans stuck with the team. Um because they had that little bit of pressure towards the end to try and get the equalise and then ultimately the winner. So um, I think we live in a world now where, you know, everything is instant, you know, hire Jesus and stuff like that. But it's it's still a common people are willing to throw out. It's just nonsensical. We have to make uh, key decisions over the next six six months, of course. And uh, But look, I felt like people were behind them in the stadium last night. Obviously, there would have been a certain amount of people who, no matter what happens, would be against the manager, no matter who it is. But I, I felt there was a positive element to around the game last night. Obviously, that changed at the end a little bit, to be fair. But by and large, I felt you get, particularly that singing section, that's made up a lot of people who support League of Ireland football, but also real football people, I would say. I felt they were very much behind the manager and the team. Um, whether their opinion has changed after last night's result, that's different. But by and large, I thought the mood was very good. And it was actually... Aviva is a very cold place, I would say. Yeah, maybe it's because we at Dundalk go there most November and it's freezing, but it was a really good evening. It was a great evening for football and it was a real, real sort of enjoyable occasion. Obviously, we wanted a better result, so that would be my synopsis of it. Apart from the cold conditions, Gavin, uh, what was the temperature that you took from what you saw? Well, the fact that there was 2,000 tickets still going before kickoff tells its own story and be interesting to see if they can get 25,000 sold for Serbia. I thought maybe they'd sell out Serbia off the back of the Portuguese performance, but if there's any left now, you know. There was people up in the old West Upper, there was people leaving before Shane Duffy's equaliser, which was kind of, yeah, of course they're fair weather fans, but they were, they no longer cared really whether it was, are they going to snatch a draw or or lose. So that was, that was uh, interesting to watch. Um, I thought the fans, I thought the crowd in general wanted to be led by the team and by the players. And in the first, from the, the national anthem, and you saw Kenny's reaction after the anthem, he was he really felt like he was uh, involved in something special and a special moment for him as Ireland manager. And for 15 minutes, the crowd stayed with them and they were getting up and really building into it. And it looked like we were going to have one of those special crowd nights. And then everything, it just... Because they lost their rhythm in that 15 to 20 minutes until uh, Azerbaijan started creating chances, uh, the crowd just went silent. You could see people didn't come back after half time that quickly. Um, uh, yeah, and it was it wasn't uh, it wasn't like a Kenny out or it wasn't the, the booze at the end were kind of a smattering. It wasn't it wasn't heavy. Um, I think actually the worst thing about it was it was it was they were quite sympathetic, which nobody wants to hear, you know, and possibly apathetic as well. Yeah. Did he get the selection right, Vinny? Did he get the tactics right? Um, for me, that's that's a huge question. Um, I would have to say 
from from a coaching perspective, look, it, this is a difficult situation for me to be in in terms of commenting on Stephen because of there's, there's a real friendship there. Um, but I just I just I I had warning signs going into the game. I think the Luxembourg I was on the show uh, in the morning with the guys after the Luxembourg game. And albeit the performance yesterday was a lot better than the Luxembourg one, there were same errors um, in the team selection or the shape of the team that I seen. Um, I think the three, and I, uh, I have to be careful because I don't want to go on too much about systems. But we played with a three, four, two, one shape. Okay, um, we we've, we've used that at home and quite a couple of occasions. But at home. Uh, it doesn't lend itself to speed and power and, and counter-attacking or even attacking at real pace. And that's my issue with it. We have a we have a, a coach in, in Anthony Barry who works with Thomas Tuchel at Chelsea and they play that system. And that system is, is a really good system and I really like it. But you, you think of Chelsea's two number 10s, you've got Mason Mount and Ziyech or, or, or Havertz, whoever it is. We don't have that yet, okay? And away from home, we've seen the quality of Jamie McGrath's passing against Portugal. We've we'll seen the, the shape of Aaron Connolly. Oh, he didn't play brilliantly, but he was a threat on the counter-attack. But at home, we went with Troy Parrott and Aaron Connolly in that position. And we ran out of ideas, as Gavin said, after the first 15 minutes. And I think that's partly down to the shape of the team. I don't think we're good enough to play that 3 4 2 one shape and dominate teams at home who are equal to us or of a lesser standard. And... I have to be honest and think that was an error. Uh, it was an error uh, going into the game. I, again, I don't know where Callum Robinson was because we're not privy to that information. We had COVID, but it was a it was a night for uh, particularly with the crowd up and all of them things. It was a night for our fullbacks. It was a night for our wingers to go and get at them. And 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 to be fair, in the last two games, Adam Adam Oida has been our best player, but he was so isolated last night in his running down the sides of people. Uh, that uh, I, I think the shape of the team was, was partly responsible for that. When I think of Ireland playing the 8th ranked team in the world, Gavin, in Portugal, and then the 112th ranked team in Azerbaijan, and I see this defender scoring both times, John Egan and Shane Duffy, that kind of explains to me the gap that if we lose and then we, we can only draw because we don't have a top-class international striker or even an international striker that can deliver a modicum of goals. Stephen Kenny has to nail his selection every time. And while he deserves enormous praise for the team he put out against Portugal, like for example, he didn't go to Troy Paris um, and it worked, paid off that team, that team performed from and that system performed from. But while saying that, you have to also say he got a very bad year wrong last night. Um, and, and the funny thing is, he's got, uh, Kenny will live and die by his selections. And Jamie McGrath is someone who he has brought through and spoken about as a natural number 10 and and. Nobody would have probably put him into the Ireland squads if not only for Kenny, even though he was doing well at St Mirren and uh, people would know him from League of Ireland backgrounds. But Jamie McGrath, maybe he was drained from the other night, but he was, the, just the way he performed against Portugal was so teed up perfectly for him to be the creative force. Troy Parrott, um, Kenny defended that selection afterwards by saying he plays in that position for MK Dons. Uh, but... Like he was anonymous at one stage, about ten minutes before half time, I said, "Okay, I'm going to actually just watch Troy Parrott and see what's happening." And it, it actually wasn't his fault. Well, for starters, he's 19 years old and he's still learning how to, uh, to play such a crucial, pivotal role in, in international football, even against Azerbaijan. Didn't work out. I thought the wings were too clogged. He had Ida in front of him. He had, P- had Malumpi coming up from behind him, and it just the game didn't break for him. And for Ireland to be successful, they needed the guy wearing number 10 for the game to break for him last night. Kenny got. He got it wrong with Aaron Connolly and he admitted as much by putting Darren Horgan on at half time. And um, that's a blow for anybody, especially someone like Connolly, who just literally cannot buy a goal at the moment. Um, he had the chances that you want a striker to, or a centre forward to get, centre forward, winger. Didn't happen for him. Um, I thought just on that point, the worst thing is the best chances fell to fullbacks. Matt Doherty and James Coleman had real chances and got to say it, they blew them. Yeah, just on Gavin's point there, the other one he hasn't mentioned is um, is Alan Brown and his form in the last 18 months for Preston. Um, now, again, he's had uh, COVID and that's why he, or not, he, he's, he's been in close contact or whatever. We don't know how fit he was and that's part of the problem in terms of discussing people, other managers' team selections. 
But Alan Brown as a natural number 10 is someone that I, I, I just I just think at home with the huge blow not having them in there. And even even when you when when you it's very simplistic to put it this way, but when Jason Malumbi was at loan at Preston, he played quite a lot. But if it was the decision for him, between him and Alan Brown, Alan Brown p- played. Um, and it's quite a simplistic way of putting it, but I just feel the, the likes of Alan Brown in that 10 position, uh, uh, maybe maybe Jamie McGrath coming out of the Portugal game, I could understand him being left out. But I just that's where, for me, it was about a system uh, error um, last night. And um, Alan Brown, I think, in that number 10, would have given us a huge threat. Um, so that's where I completely agree with Gavin. It's just, just to throw Alan Brown into that mix in that position. It was a huge blow. And that, you're spot on, Vinny. And the thing is that the frustrating thing about that is Brown was used. Brown did come on, you know. Uh, Callum Robinson, again, had COVID, but he did come on. So if you're able to give 15, 20 minutes in an international, you know, you you, you shouldn't have any any kind of signs of, of having COVID, you know, or your injury. I know Brown had an injury as well. But the fact that he did turn to them, um, yeah, look, I, I think this... This result could be really damaging in the long term because Serbia looks so impressive. Only scored a sort of goals against Luxembourg, and I, I can't see us getting a getting a result, getting a draw. Like a draw is a result against Serbia on Tuesday night. Um, so this result is going to this this is going to haunt. This is going to come back to haunt Kenny at the end of this when there's talks of a contract next where his contract extension happens next summer. He's going to need. Oh, they're going to have to take points off Portugal at home, or they're going to have to. As the as the yeah. as the good feeling around Portugal gone now, Gavin then. When the FAI are thinking to themselves, mm, are we going to back a long-term well, project here and forget about the campaign and we see this, the progress of Stephen Kenny? Are we back into this being in the mix now? No. Be- oh, well, so, yeah, yes. On the outside, yes. But that doesn't really... The only thing that matters is the players. And I imagine the players know why they didn't hit the heights themselves last night. And I imagine them, a lot of them know it's because of this failure that had been marked months in advance because of the Luxembourg game gun. It's very hard for these guys who are not playing regular football in the championship, even or league one to get exposure to, to recover and play three games in, in six days. Um, but I'd say they know that they can probably go to the other level and get a result against Serbia. And maybe, maybe, maybe there's a master plan here. It was because we go hell for letter against Portugal. We try and scrape a win against Azerbaijan and go hell for letter again against Serbia which indicates then that he'll go very close back to the team that performed in, uh, in on the Algarve. Um, so the players are out and they're tweeting a lot about how they're taking responsibility themselves. And um, that's quite evident. Like the FAI retweeted Shane Duffy saying this, that it was on us as the players. But they are playing, I feel, for like another... They really are this and then going to Azerbaijan next month. They are playing for Kenny's uh, job for him, you know, because even though everyone wants... Well, I'd say a lot of people, majority, maybe a lot of ex-internationals don't see Richard Dunn and Paul McGrath coming out, but that's par for the course. That happens come out against an Ireland manager. But uh, there has to be something. There has to be this Portuguese performance. The players have to be able to prove that they can replicate that on Tuesday. They have to be able to do it away in Azerbaijan. Otherwise, it becomes increasingly difficult for what everyone wants is the long-term plan of Stephen Kenny getting a real belt at a European Championships where Ireland should really, with these guys in a year's time, should really qualify definitely you know but um it's about this team now if they want him as manager they gotta literally get results to keep him because as much as they're taking responsibility for themselves it has to be on kenny because he does pick the team and he does put the tactics out and well, there's no way, of a way for it. so as brilliant as the algarve was and i was there and it was a thrilling atmosphere and it was an unbelievable performance by so many players like matt doherty was a great a good example of him performing at left, left wing back to put the bet seemed to put the bed that whole thing and then we have himself and Coleman try to mix the match on the right, which didn't work. Um, so it does come back to the manager again. And I feel like these players are, they have to perform or that man will not be their manager in a year's time. Well, I think that some of the ex-pros would have been fans of Mick. Um, that's what I was. So I don't know if it's every manager, but um, I, I, I'm just interested uh, in this results argument, Vinny. You know, you're a manager. You know what results do in terms of confidence. There's a feeling out there that we have to get results and that will then bring breed confidence within the team and that will then act as a domino for future performances. Um, do the people who say we got to just get the results first and then worry about the, the plan and the performances have a point? Um, I would say I would say no. By and large, I would say no because um, we, ha- we had to change something from where we were 18 months ago. 
uh, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't nice on the eye, and and it wasn't good. So we did. We do have to change something. Um, and we've said about we've gone down this path with Stephen, and um, I, I, I think I think it's just too early to cast judgment on it. But we live in an instant world where um, everybody has has these opinions, and everyone is writing articles or blogs or on podcasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and it's great that football is spoken about so highly, but it creates another problem where uh, there's people under pressure to make decisions. Um, for me. For me, you, there was no way in two years' time we were going to see a huge change in uh, Ireland results. We've seen it with Wales, Scotland, the Northern Ireland in particular, uh, rebuild themselves over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and they started to see some of the fruits of that. They see Northern Ireland seen it under, seen it under Michael O'Neill. They also put other processes in place below, below the first team level that we haven't certainly done. Wales had it. Uh, got to a semi-final of European Championships and had some difficult results. Um, and, and the same with Scotland, some really dark years. And they they all, with the exception of Northern Ireland, they would have better structures in terms of players' availability to them um, than we would have. So I just don't think we can switch from everybody saying after the, the Portugal game, gives, not everybody, but vast majority of people saying, give Stephen a new contract. And then almost 72 hours later say... You know, you need Jesus Christ to come back and save us. It's not as it can't be as black and white as that. We're going to have to take a medium-term decision uh, eventually in Irish football because all we've done for the last twenty years is just take short-term appointments and not try and fix football in Ireland. And uh, this is just a massive opportunity to fix it. And ultimately, um, whether Stephen's the right man or not, that will that will play itself out over the next six months, nine months, two years. But we can't be just uh, taking rough shot decisions after one game or two games. One goes for us, one goes against us. We've got to take a long term view of it. I feel. Look, I'm not a manager of any of you much more experience than I do uh, about this. Uh, the reason why I said in articles for OTB and on yesterday on the show, and I still maintain this, is because if you say that Stephen Kenny, we're going to give you until the end of the Euros, I think that's a fair assessment when you have 24 teams in Germany. And when you have results, then you'll have enough time with the players and then you can be judged on completely with the results unless it turns into a Steve Staunton type, type situation with his managerial tenure. And I don't think we're at that yet. Um, I think there are many factors at play here that are bigger than Stephen Kenny. Uh, the fact that the, the FEI, had, it emerged that they weren't financially uh, run uh, in a, as a going concern. Uh, the fact that there's not much state investment in football which is the biggest participated sport in the country. When you have horse racing and greyhound racing, horse racing is under the Department of Agriculture. They get millions a year because they're seen as an industry. Football is not seen as, as an industry in this country. You have the global aspect of the Premier League now, which is making it harder for young Irish players to, to live the dream and, and succeed as they would have done in the 80s, 90s and, and noughties. So there are many things at play here and I just kind of feel that taking this, the uncertainty out of Stephen's position and the build... Um, will surely help everybody going forward that, no, we're sticking to this. Because at the moment, I think there's a lot of hankering back to Jack's days and Mick's days yeah. and being at the tournaments and being on the jolly and the expectations John, are not, not in touch with reality. Can I jump in on that, John, before Gavin comes in? Just I just watched Wales and Belarus today, OK? Um, the game was in the balance. Wales didn't play well. And Garrett Barry started a hat-trick, get Wales over the line in a 3-2 win. OK, that made me think, made me think because we don't have a guard bail. We're, we're trying to find the next one. We thought it was Troy Parrott and maybe it will be in time, et cetera, et cetera. It made me think before I came on the show and I had a look at Group J, OK? After four games, Armenia are top of the group, Germany are second, North Macedonia are third on seven points, Romania are fourth, Iceland are fifth, and Liechtenstein are sixth. So that's a huge seismic change in European world football, if you think of that group. Armenia on top, Germany second, North Macedonia, Romania, and then Iceland. And remember, we are all looking at Iceland a few years ago. How did they do what they've done? How did they... All of these countries have been investing in uh, systems and investing on youth coaches, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, something that we just don't do. And I'm not trying to get away from... Uh, Stephen Kenny, I think he, I think you made a huge point. We need to put, we need to take out the uncertainty and get a point on 
into European championships and make it a medium term view of it. Make sure it's very clear he's going to be a manager. And yes, if we completely fall off the rails and we aren't capable of winning matches, then, then we get rid of him. Okay, but for now we need that security, and we must start learning from our mistakes. Brexit, for example, happened for, or five years. The FAI have known Brexit was coming, and more or less we haven't invested a red cent into underage football. Yet there's some great work going on. And we're seeing some good players. We haven't invested a red cent into real money into underage football. So, what, do people think North Macedonia just turned up at the Euros and it happened overnight? It was an eight and nine year project. Um, Azerbaijan have something like 26 full time coaches on average associated with each of their academies. In Ireland, the average is zero. There's only six people full-time employed to all the league running clubs uh, as a, an academy coach. Only six full-time staff, according to the FEO inspectors. So our average is actually less than zero. And Azerbaijan's is 26. So, okay. you know, unless you... I hope everyone's it. listening to, to, to what you're saying, uh, Vinny. It, it, it's right on the money. But, uh, but at the same time, we can't blame John Delaney for what happened last night. You can't blame the Irish government for what happened last night. And for, for all the stuff that the development needs to happen and everything you're saying, like it would be a dream come true and it's been something that people have been banging their head against for years. But the fact remains, I, we, we can't blame the defeats to the performances against Luxembourg and Azerbaijan for the historical past. I know it's it's connected, but we have to go back to like this this whole Stephen Kenny pro project um, cannot survive if he keeps if he, these, with these kind of results. Like he still hasn't got a competitive win. He's got four qualifying matches to go now between now and the middle of November. And like two of them are, you'd be very surprised if we got draws. The other two are away from home. He he needs two wins here, at minimum, you know. Yeah, but uh, haven't, in spectacular fairness, result against one of the big boys. Otherwise, it's very hard to stay with him and to, to support what, what so many people want him to do, want to get him to get this team that he had at under 21s and bring them to another level. Which he which he can do, and I think I think he does have the ability to do it, but he can't make any more mistakes against teams like Azerbaijan and survive. Yeah, but to be fair, I, I was critical of Stevens' uh, selections yesterday, and I was I was critical I was critical of against Luxembourg, so I'm not brushing that under the carpet. Uh, what, why I bring up the 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 point about appointing him as manager for the Euro, so it's not a short term view. Is take his under 21s team you speak about, okay? Once we couldn't qualify for Serbia, all of them players should have been told, Ireland were on the brink of qualifying for an under-21 tournament. They should have been all told, Gavin Bazunu, uh, Kevin Kelleher, uh, Malumbi, Ida Conley should have been told, go and concentrate on the 21s. We'll take some pain with our first team and we try and get our 21s to a national, tour, uh, international tournament. Okay, We take a medium-term view of it. That team was on the brink of achieving something special, but that needed leadership. That needed someone in the FEI to say, stop, Stephen, don't worry about the next four or five results. Build your team. And we want to get a team qualified as an under-21 team. And we bring them all together on a journey. That's what Iceland would do. That's what Azerbaijan would do. That's what North Macedonia would do. And then when they qualify for tournaments, instead of sitting in the studio going, uh, getting an Icelandic journalist on to ask them, how do you achieve great things? We'd be saying, this is how we've done it. We, we stuck with our 21s. And that's what I'm talking about, Gavin, about leadership. If Stephen makes a mess of this job, he will be fired, and rightly so, okay? And I, I'm, I'm, I'm on, I'm agreed with that. That's football. That's management. It happened to me 18 months ago. I made a mess of Dundalk. They got rid of me. That's life. You live with it. You cry into your cup of tea, and you move on as a manager. But we I need saw, leadership as well. I and brought you back, Vinny, so. Yes. I saw it. Well, somebody saw the light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We well, got to well, go, go on, Vinny, well, quickly. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, feel free, but I just think it's not. I'm not talking about long-term plans to to try and save Stephen's uh, uh, job here. I'm saying there has to be all of these things have to come together for a success, successful international team. We're no longer able to compete at the highest level. Yeah, you had all that uncertainty in 2005. I covered the campaign about Brian Kerr, and I don't think it helped the team. Um, back then and we saw what happened afterwards as Steve Stone to come in was not the right appointment so look 
Uh, we're going to get the listeners involved as well, 53106, but Gavin Comiskey from the Irish Times and Vinnie Perth are going to be back to you after the break. Let's before, just before we go to the break, let's get an update from Croke Park because there's 10 minutes left in the ladies' football final and it's on a knife edge. Me than Dublin, Cora Staunton. Yeah, John, it's on a knife edge, surely. Uh, it's one tin to ten points here. Meters a goal up, um, and they just have a, probably a 30-meter free here from Emma Duggan. Um, it's been in the min second half. Um, low scoring for the first part of it, but Mead have, you know, held Dublin um, to, you know, a couple of points, and you know they didn't score for the first ten or twelve minutes themselves, but they, they've been amazing. Their running game has been amazing. Um, just as Emma Duggan just misses a free there, so it's still three points in it. But Meads running game, their fitness levels have been amazing. Dublin are still struggling on the kick out, and yeah, the Mead defence have been amazing in this um, half. Really haven't given Dublin anything, and you know, it's whether they can last the pace of the game. Emma Murray made two substitutions there two minutes ago, and were badly needed, and the substitutions had had an immediate impact. Okay, thanks, Cora, for the moment. Dramatic finish in store, surely at uh, Croke Park, between Meath and Dublin in the ladies' football final. Meath one ten, Dublin ten points. We're back with Vinnie Perth and Gavin Comiskey after this break to talk about the Republic of Ireland. And you're welcome back to Off the Ball here on News Talk. John Duggan sitting in for John Malloy today until seven. Uh, we're joined on Football Hour by Dundalk boss Vinnie Perth and the Irish Times soccer correspondent Gavin Comiskey. So Gavin and Vinny reflecting upon uh, the Republic of Ireland's one-all draw with Azerbaijan. Looking ahead now to Tuesday's game against Serbia, the World Cup qualifier. We're out of it. Effectively, we're gone from the World Cup, but it's really about where we are as a nation and, and some good points made in the first half of the show. Uh, 53106 is the listener number for texts. Uh, you can get in touch at the cost of 30 cent. Please do and on Twitter, at Off the Ball. Here are some of the comments. The reaction to Stephen Kenny is not an instant knee-jerk one. He's well into his tenure. We've had one or two decent performances, no decent results. He's out of his depth. He hasn't got the skill set to manage these players at this level. We've got players at this level to beat Azerbaijan and Luxembourg. Our players are all professionals at a high level. He has the players to win games at this level. He's an amateur in a professional game, says one of our textures with a harsh comment. Uh, the bizarre Stephen Kenny love and continues. I truly despair, says another of our textures. I don't agree with that. Uh, does Kenny trying to play pep ball not just ignore the fact that Ireland has not produced a player for 20 years? Surely you make the most of what you have rather than foist a shape on players not able for it, says Aaron. An under-21 success does not ensure senior success. Kilban, Dunn, etc. say all of it. What's been lost over the Portugal match is the influence Ronaldo, like Messi, have in raising the level of the opposition's game. Players focus far more intensely than they do against the Azerbaijanis, says Brian. Gavin, what do you think of all this? You know, I was talking to... Uh, to uh ex-footballer friends of mine on Friday night and um, one of them was you know he played just played football in England for most of his career so he's he's again still a bit bit thick about Mick McCarthy's now having the job and doesn't feel that Kenny's up to it and that's the um that's the unresearched view of Stephen Kenny you know what I mean um that they don't know that he's been a professional coach for what 23 24 years um but everything me and the other guy did to convince him that he was wrong about Kenny and that uh, a lot of what Finney said there that, that Stephen's building something from this 21s and he's taking these players forward a lot of it's sullied by the 21s players not performing for him in the senior setup last night you know it, it's it's very very difficult to defend the Stephen Kenny era with uh, a one-all with Azerbaijan especially 24 hours after a one-all with Azerbaijan and it's very hard to defend it, defend him when he, he did go with three guys whose jobs are to score goals for their clubs in England and he went with them up front to get, uh, together and it did not work like he, he had to basically he had to go back on his game plan at half time and um that was the most disappointing aspect of it um i think people have been i think the people who've made up their mind about Stephen kenny made it up before he even came into the job anyway so i don't think they're ever going to have their minds changed i think there is a lot of people who sit on the fence and i think they were in the a lot of them were in the crowd last night who want to be taken somewhere with with him who wants Stephen kenny to convince them that he knows he he is the man for this job for two, three, four, six years, you know, because having a guy who's based at home running the job is good for business. Having a guy who's got an encyclopedic knowledge of the players is good for business. The only problem is it hasn't worked. And the, all the successful managers have not been that in the history of Irish football. My, I'd love to get, I'd love to know Vinny's view on this is, my worry was it was 30 crosses were banged in in the second half, I think. Um, and that's what we were doing to try and hunt the goal against a team that was sitting back against the team that we know from their coach when he was with Albania is def ridiculously defensively minded. And that's how he plays. You know, he sets up shop. And 
it, it's depressing that we aren't able to break that. We weren't able to break that down, and then it just became more and more desperate. And then we had to turn to you know who, Mister the Dairy Giant, to come on. Just like we had to we use Johnny Egan's head in Portugal to score goals. Um, that's desperately worrying. I, 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 Adam Eda, though he he had a chance. He had a great one of the, one of his chances was a great chance, and, and Malumbi definitely should have scored his chance as well. Um, and so, as Stephen Kenny said, if those had gone in, we'd be having a different conversation today. But they didn't, and we're not. And it just heaps the pressure on uh, Ireland to get a result against Serbia, which is hugely difficult. Because Serbia have to stay point for point with uh, Portugal. Because you don't want to finish second in, in a World Cup qualifier group, because there's only three spots left then. You go into a semi and a final to get to Qatar. So Serbia pro- do feel like they're, they're good enough to top the group ahead of Portugal, and they'll see this as a, a signature game. It was Mick McCarthy stuff at the end, Stephen, with the... Uh... Kenny was employing Vinny with the crosses into the box. Yeah, and there's no getting away from that. Ultimately, um, for all the stuff we're looking to change, we ended up with just a lot of crosses into the box. And Shane Duffy got his head on it. The last couple of minutes I seen uh, at the game was remarkable. Looks like Seamus Coleman was completely empty. He basically stood high up on the right wing, and Ireland had a back two. Uh, it was strange. Um, but yeah, so that that is that is not a good reflection of where where Stephen is, has taken this team. We ended up relying on a Duffy goal. Um, look, um, I, th- I think they got it wrong last night. So I'm not I, I'm not in any way, shape, or form uh, uh, defending anything that happened last night. Um, I, ju- I just come at it a bit mo- bit more of a long term view. Um, and and again, Adam Eda is a good example of it. John, you, you'll know this better than me. You're better at this stuff. But was it 21 games before John Aldridge scored for him? It was a lot. Uh, was it Malta uh, in 1989? Um, yeah. Well, it was a long time. And, uh, uh, they were going to major tournaments. Yeah, no. And I, uh, Listen, I, 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 hear, I hear you, Gavin. I'm just saying that it's going to take us a while to get these players to the level that are required. The, the option is, if it's not Stephen Kenny, uh, who is it? And do we rip Would it be any ball? different? Would it be any different, Vinny? I'm looking back at the and the re, there's a reason why Martin O'Neill is no longer the Irish manager. I know Roy Keane called it a disgrace on his uh, chat with Gary Neville, and I know that Mick McCarthy it might have been a bit unfortunate he didn't get that Slovakia game. But O'Neill and Keane, there was one goal in four games against Wales and Denmark, and in the whole of the Mick McCarthy qualification campaign, which to be fair we were in with a chance with against Denmark, they scored seven goals in eight games. This is down to putting the ball in the back of the net. It's the most basic thing to say. But Robbie Keane scored sixty-eight goals. How many times did he kind of bail us out of a situation by scoring goals? And that is the issue we have. We can't put the ball in the net. Uh, yeah, and and I, I think part of the setup of the team yesterday. So I don't give a Stephen a pass on last night. I certainly don't. Um, I think that'd be wrong of me to come on here and give him a pass. Uh, I think the setup of the team didn't help. Uh, but we, we haven't got someone who's uh, regularly able to put the ball in the back of the net. They're not doing it at club level. Um, it's not as if Stephen is, is starting Adam either in, in, in place of somebody else, whereas there's a real debate where someone else should be playing. So we have got issues around that position. Um, so, I, I, unfortunately, I'm left with I don't know the answer to this other than I think we've got to going back to a couple of points I made earlier on. I think we've got to look at this as a medium term uh, plan and have a balanced view of it and give someone a chance to actually change a couple of things because you know I, I heard Roy Keane I thought a fascinating interview, but it did get pretty grim towards the end of the Martin O'Neill uh, tenor. It got pretty grim in, in, in terms of our style of play. Uh, so I'm not saying it was much better last night, but certainly we're, we're heading in a new direction and we've got to have a look at it and, and see where we come up. So it, it is, it's a difficult one. It's a difficult one uh, to answer fully um, for me. I have to be honest with you. The FAI, because especially their board now, which is very, very cognizant of their, finan- their perilous financial situation, they don't want to get rid of Stephen Kenny because the guy they have to pay for, if, if Jonathan Hill, we don't know what Jonathan Hill's views are on this, obviously he has to keep his cards close to his chest, but I imagine he'd be going into the English, the British market, and that's going to cost them, that'll be double. Sorry, them. Gavin, Gavin, just have to interrupt you there because as history has been made here at Croke Park for the first ever time, Mead are the All-Ireland Ladies Football Champions. Cora Staunton, how do they do it? 
Oh God, I don't know. Um, they were absolutely magnificent. I'm here, but uh, Ashley and O'Reilly is here crying beside me. Um, what a wonderful performance. Right from the start to finish, from the first minute to the last, they were absolutely amazing. How they did it was just belief, hard work, and the ultimate team performance. You know, if you were to pick out a player of the match, I don't even think I could do it, because right from Monica McGurk, who was so composed right throughout the whole game, never gave away a kick out, up to um, Nevo Sullivan, who had a stormer, scored three points from play, but caused huge problems. Vicky Wall, I could, I could name the, the first 15, and even the girls that came on. It was just unbelievable, a, a, a huge team performance, and massive credit um, you know, has to go to Eamon Murray and his management team. Let's remember, these girls were intermediate champions nine months ago, and... Honestly, I haven't been at a ladies' football match where, you know, I feel like I'm a fan and, you know, it's just an, an absolute amazing performance, you know. Huge credit to, to Dublin. They've been unbelievable champions, um, you know, for the last four years. But, you know, today is all about me, their performance, their their teamwork and their never say die. And I love the way right from the start um, they went out and attacked that game and, and had no fear all day long. Yeah, a super performance. Mead 11 Dublin 12 points, the full-time score at Croke Park. Cora, uh, we'll get to you and Ashleen after 6 o'clock for a recap on that because that was just incredible. And Eamon Murray, they're getting the congratulations in front of 40,000 people. They're going to be lifting that trophy in a very f- uh, short period of time. Mead one eleven, Dublin 12 points. Mead for the first ever time in their history, our ladies All-Ireland Football Champions. Congratulations to the Royals. Uh, Gavin Comiskey, you were saying there that the FAI, I suppose, don't want to get rid of Stephen Kenny because they don't want to pay off and they don't want to have to start this process all over again. It's, isn't their interest really to keep them on, isn't it? Yeah, but and Roy, Roy Barrett said this, if if the results go the way they hope, if they're uh, respectable, if they show progress is the quote, uh, yeah, he sees no reason why he wouldn't. Of course we want Steve, Stephen Kenny to be a success uh, in Irish football. He he's comes from Irish football, you know. Uh, so it was as much as we all wanted, we all mo- wanted and hoped Brian Kerr would be a success. And when he came in, and we hoped that that he would have been rehabilitated back into the system. But we all know why that didn't happen. And we, we this is this is a project that a lot of people want to succeed. But that's why it's, that's why last night was so damaging, you know, because they they need now to see progress. Okay, so what is progress? What does progress look like with this team? I think for starters, it's a settled team now. He didn't. Kenny obviously didn't believe that it was if we they got two good results against Portugal and Azerbaijan with the same team, he'd have any players left for Serbia. I'm guessing this, you know. I'm presu- I'm using logic to presume that he knows that he's got too many key players who are not playing regular football in England, and so he wanted to get the best out of them. And so that's I, I, I'm thinking that's why Hendrik and McGrath were, weren't on the field yesterday or weren't, didn't even come on. I'm guessing they're either nothing in the tank or he's just recharging their batteries for the Serbia game. Um, and so it's always going to be a little bit of a risk when you don't have, you know, when a lot of the players you want to pick aren't playing club football, but it backfired, you know, it didn't work. So now he has to show progress. He had, so this team and progress is a result against Serbia. Progress is, that, and that means he has to get the team right, he has to get the tactics right. And it, it looked like the tactics were flying in Portugal with Coleman and Doherty as wingbacks coming up um, with, uh, with McGrath's, uh, just ability to create, you know, and especially his corners is the best example of that for Egan's goal. Um, does, yeah, look, we were, we're so close to ha- being able to start talking about Ida being the man to lead us for the next five, six, ten years, you know. He just needed one of those ch- one of those chances to go in. And he needs to be playing club football though regularly as well, doesn't he, and scoring goals in club football regularly. Well, yeah, Adam, Adamita's not going to be playing. Adamita needs an injury now at Norwich for him to be playing regular club yeah, football. Yeah, that's the, that's the problem. Yeah, it's a, it's a massive problem. Aaron Connolly hasn't got anywhere near the, Br- the, the Brighton team, as far as I know. Um, Parrot's playing really well in League One. Um, and so putting them all up together, you know, was a great idea, you know. Like, if you're, if, if you knew something that we didn't know about how, like, they're all going to co- collect, like, disconnect. The problem was, I just, the positioning of them was the flaw, you know, and just Aaron Connolly's confidence. Um, so now I don't know how, how well they've done for Aaron Connolly's confidence for taking him off at half time, but it had to be done. Daryl Horgan immediately showed what he should be doing. He should be playing, even though he's down in Wicked Wanderers in, in the lower leagues in England. Uh, every time he comes on for Ireland, he does something like that. He shows an energy. Um, and it's just, it's vital now that these these names, like, I know Tommy Conlon was writing about it a couple of weeks ago and in the, about how we, nobody knows who this Irish team is anymore. And, and I know by, um, 
by the middle of the week that, that article was looking quite silly and then by last night it was spot on again so we need to get familiar with this team you can almost pick the back five now for every big game they play uh, if Darrell Shea hadn't gone injured um, but now they have to they have to get a team that's that's regular and familiar and you know there's going to be every successful team you know eight or nine of the players every time you know in international level I feel so and that's how uh, to some of our parts is that that's how we're going to be a success or, or be or get back to a level of respectability because we've lost that 53106 uh, you're like Fox News defending Trump I think we get that text in every week uh, Vinny's bang on great Portugal team is built off the under 21s Bobby the dub take the hit now or going nowhere uh, regarding Kenny you can analyse it all day long but you can't win without scoring goals we don't have anybody to do that other than that we're a decent team says Cole and talk of medium or long term is a grand but that doesn't come with a free pass for the short term there has to be a base level of acceptable results and one point from six against Luxembourg and Azerbaijan as well below it Kenny's interviews are real comical alley stuff his supporters hiding behind words like progress and long term is nonsense he deserves the rest of the campaign but he needs to start getting acceptable results Gavin is talking sense not more sure that many others in the media are says Paul in Waterford OK, Tuesday, Vinnie Perth, what does he need to do in terms of his team selection and tactics? Um, I, I think at home, it, it's difficult because Serbia play that sort of 3-4-3 system. So for me, I think Ireland at home, uh, the Stephen Kenny I know will play, would play a 4-3-3. OK, I think whether it's Callum Robinson on one wing, um, whether it's a Daryl Horgan on the other wing, or whatever combinations he comes up with, um, with uh, Alan Brown and the number ten, and Adam Eder leading the line. Um, if, if that if that means a big call uh, at the back, so be it. But that's Seamus Coleman playing at right back, uh, Matt Doherty playing at left back. But I think he's got to play four three three. You're at home. You've got to. Why did he get the job? We'll go back to why he got the job. Um, he got the job because of his, his his beliefs in football, his attacking style. He took Dundalk to Zenit St Petersburg and hit the crossbar in the 92nd minute to, to, to win the game. And he was brave in his decisions. And, and, and that's where, like, we can't go. I, I, and I'm sorry, I think I'm on the fence now, I'd like to think. But when I, when I see Gavin making the point about him, and, and it's sort of, it could have been brave with starting Ovida, Conley and uh, Troy Parrott. But then he got the plaudits for bringing on the centre-half um uh, from Norwich, uh, help me with his pronunciation. Momo Medele, I think. Uh, I yeah. might be wrong. Yeah, no, exactly. Momo but he, what he done, what what he done there was against Portugal. He showed what Stephen Kenny's all about. He was brave. He brought a 19 year old on, put him on in a huge game of football, and the kid rise to the challenge. That's what we need in football. And I think that's what he needs to do in between now and Tuesday: is be brave, go back to what he believes in, hacking style of football, fullbacks uh, bombing on. Uh, his number 10 being creative, scoring goals. That's what Alan Brown can do. And I think that's his best way out of this. And um, that's what that would be my message to him. Not, uh, if I had to give him one, that would be it. What about his midfield? Um, we, we've got different combinations in, in terms of, like Alan Brown in the 10, it means you've got to have two behind them. Whether that's, whether we've seen Hurahan and Hendrick, at least Hurahan gives us that sort of distribution. Josh Cullen was very good away in Portugal. But in a different system, and he only had limited ball time. In terms of yesterday, I felt some of his pass. He didn't make enough forward passes for us. Again, a young lad who's finding his feet, and his time will come. We need someone to make forward and quick passes. Um, and and the people that are, are at the Aviva will get behind this team if we're an attack-minded team, and if we we punish uh, Serbia in the wide areas because of their shape. So for me, it would be. It could be a mixture of, of two or three people. We're, 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 we're not that strong in that number six position to dictate games, but we've got players like Hendrik Hurahan, um, Malumbi, Colin, all played or are, are good players at that. And we find that right combination. For me, it's Hurahan alongside uh, because he can he can become that sort of, uh, we call it that defensive midfielder who can go from there and, and score goals. We've seen it with Aston Villa over the years and, and get forward. Um, so he, he has different options in midfield but a 4-3-3 for me whatever way you want to do that 4-2-3-1 all of that rubbish but get a number 10 into the team and get wingers in and create chances and I think will to me that's how we score and that's how Stephen plays football in my view you're right talent, talent wise Horan should be in there but just consistency is, is, I think is a major issue and uh, every when the midfield is so key and for the first time in a long time there's no every single player we've talked about and mentioned there are all championship 
championship clubs, either on loan championship clubs, except for um, except obviously for Jeff Hendrick, who's not getting into the Newcastle team regularly. So we have a bunch of mid-tier Premier League uh, midfielders, and it, clearly there's a massive jump from championship to mid-tier. Otherwise, these the Irish players wouldn't be struggling to get into the Aston Villas and ended up having to go to West Brom's or whatever. So that's a problem that we have. We need a yeah, and, and as we talked earlier about Wales and Scotland, like Billy Gilmore, you know, Aaron Ramsey, th- these kind of guys, we don't have that at the moment. And it would be, it's it's something that we we didn't realise how much we needed until it, until it left, you know, until it was gone. Um, yeah, so that we do need that. But the mid, yeah, Vin, Vinny's right. And I hope what the, two, the two lads he picks is, is is spot on and it works at those three midfielders because they need... That's the only, Sorry, you can pick the Irish defence, you understand? And you can probably pick the Irish attack, but... We could be picking the Irish midfield all day here and not come up with the right guys because nobody's playing consistently enough at a high enough level. Well, just on your point about championship players and, and look, I think I think you if you can build a team, like Wales done it all, be it they had Gareth Bale, but if you can build a team, you can get away with championship level or because it's not a bad level. If you look at Mitrovic, is that mm. it scored two goals? Was it the other day for Serbia? He's he's sort of the main striker. He's not playing in the Prem at the moment, or you know, he played a lot of football championship. Um, it doesn't have to be being a championship player, a regular player, is not necessarily a bad thing for Ireland where they are now because we, we, we set the bar of premiership players. The level in the premiership has gone so high now, and the amount of foreign talent there that we might have to accept that the core of our team comes from the championship. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, albeit we prefer our players playing in, in the premiership. International football teams can punch above. Greece won the Euros, Turkey and South Korea reached semi-finals of World Cup. It can happen. We played well against what Portugal. Common, what was the common denominator, John? It was all the sum of the, they were some of the parts teams. Yeah. You know, they weren't relying on centre halves to score winners. You know, it wasn't thirty crosses against the team ranked one hundred and twelfth in the world. I'm being unbelievably negative, but it's very it's it, it's very hard to, to find positive shoots because we're so we're still so close to that performance, and it, it did really happen. You know. So you but don't yeah, your team leaves aren't positive, lads. We can have a massive change in attitude very quickly if uh, we we pull a real like a, a, a result. Uh, and Adam Ida scores a goal and we get a one all draw with Serbia. There'd be, be no shame in that, and and it, that would bring the Portuguese performance right back into light. And it would really it would it would allow Kenny to actually move into the next two months where with actual confidence in his management and in his and more so confidence in his players because obviously he never he's not the kind of man to ever come out and criticize them, but. A lot of them didn't do it for him last night. And that's why I bring up Armenia for argument's sake and top of Group J. They're beating Germany. None of their players, yeah. have, not very few of their players are playing uh, Premiership football. Yeah, You know, it can be done with the right team and the right combinations. And that's why people will, will, will probably snigger at me talking about that 21s team and not allowing them. That's why the FIO needs to lead, leadership now. Allowing them to develop as a team. And, and we have to take, that's why I go back to medium term view of it. All, albeit, Stephen's next six months are huge, are huge. He has to show um, a real change and the results have to improve. There's no doubt about that. Do you think we I'm can. Gonna, you, you notice, I, I imagine in the next two years, whether it's Stephen or we're not, just looking at the under 21 squads, the last one that are coming into the senior team now, and the team that beat Bosnia there during the week 2 0, um, like Evan Ferguson's only 16, there's so much expectation of that what he could do. Um, but there's, there's there's players that are that really do look like they have the potential to be top level championship, middle tier Premier League, whatever. A lot of them playing in Germany. There's there's talent that if you're looking just beneath the surface, you are pretty encouraged. But that's not going to help Stephen Kenny in the next six months. No, but um, there is there is quality coming through in midfield where we are. It seems like we're surely lacking at the moment. Okay. So okay, there is hope. And is there hope? Briefly, very briefly for Tuesday, Gavin. Um, yeah, well, again, yeah. If I if I dig deep back into what happened when I was in Portugal, uh, in Portugal, in the stand watching that performance for eighty eight minutes, yes. And Vinny, is there hope for you for Tuesday? Yes, there is. I'm not giving up hope yet. Um, I really hope this turns around. I think the, the man deserves it. He's he's deserved this shot. Um, he's got to get better. Absolutely, got to get better. But the hope, I hope this just turns around for him, and I hope it starts on Tuesday. OK, Vinny Perth, Gavin Kominski. Thanks so much for the last hour and uh, speak soon. Take care. Thanks. See you later. Vinny Perth and Gavin Kominski there. The Dundalk manager and the Irish Times football correspondent speaking about the Republic of Ireland. Lots to digest over off the ball over the next few days on News Talk here about the uh, Serbia game, the build-up and then the reaction to it. There's so much to come on OTBAM, our digital uh, show, and then on the evening show and off the ball. So... 
Let's hope we're going to be celebrating something uh, after Tuesday night. Uh, we're going to be back after the news because Meath are celebrating big time. Their ladies have won the All-Ireland final for the first time in their history, the footballers. won 11 to 12 points over Dublin at Croke Park. They've upset the four in a row winners. We're going to reflect on it all with Cora Staunton and Ashley O'Reilly, a proud royal, after the news. So don't go away.